Linger, how we doing? <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. It's so fun to worship with you today and just sit at the throne. That ministered to me. Stand right there and just reflect on the goodness of God that he is holy. Uh, I'm so excited about where we're headed uh, in just a few moments. And so just to start off, and as we get to know each other, let me ask you a, a personal question. Uh, some of you will have to be vulnerable in this, but uh, anyone here f afraid to fly? Oh, come on, so I'm not alone, okay? So there's some, there's some of you out there that, are, that have a fear of flying. So for, the, for most of my life, I've had a crippling fear of flying. True story. And so there was a season in my life where I had to get on a plane every single week, and I hated it. And I, I would just go through this kind of ritual every time of, of you know, waiting in those long lines in the airport. I don't like the airport either. And then once I would kind of go through that, that hallway and then get on the plane, and, uh, and I'm sitting there, and, you know, my, I, I'm sweating, I'm, I'm kind of shaking, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm turning that air vent up, like, put the air on me, you know, like, let's, let's get this thing, and, I, and, I, and, I, and then we get up in the air, and it's always bumpy, like, I have the worst experiences flying, I mean, that's, that's why I was afraid, every single time I get up there, it was something awful going on, something terrible happening, and I could tell you uh, dozens of stories, I'll tell you one, and so when, before we had kids, my wife Monica and I, she was a teacher, and it was spring break, and so we were going uh, to Fort Lauderdale for spring break. And so she and I, uh, we go to the airport. I'm, of course, terrified. You know, she's talking me through it. And uh, she's the big, strong Monica. And, uh, and so then we, we get on the plane. We get up in the air. And the, the captain comes on and says, hey, we're going to experience some rough air today. And I'm like, of course we are, because I'm on the plane, you know. And so I'm like, you got the entire sky, buddy. You can't find, like, somewhere there's no rough air. Now, you could go anywhere, like, find a pathway where there's no rough air. But anyways, we're going to experience some rough air. So I go to pray. You know, I'm praying, Lord, you, I hope he's wrong. And can you make the air smooth? And, uh, and then we, we hit the rough air. All right, and so it starts bumping around. I pull out my Bible. This is a little superstitious, if I'm honest. I'm just like reading the scriptures, and and uh, and and then we hit this like giant pocket. I don't know. The plane fell out of the sky and like caught itself. Okay, my Bible bounces off the ceiling. True story. All right, the guy in front of me was drinking coffee. Poor soul. And so that's all over him at this point. And I'm sitting there, and the lady behind me, there's this older lady behind me, this grandmother with, a grand, with grandchildren on each side of her, and she starts praying. And I'm like, that's a good idea. I turn around in my seat, and I grab her hand, okay? <laughs> she has her eyes closed, and she opens one eye, and I go, keep praying, lady. And, uh, <laughs> and so she's uh, saying this prayer, and then I get to thinking, like as we wrap up, she says amen. I turn back around. I'm experiencing some peace. I'm like wait a minute, I, I just went into vocational ministry. I'm like, you're not gonna kill me now. Like, I just made this transition. Like, surely you're gonna keep me alive to actually do the ministry that you called me to. And, uh, and like, I'm in ministry, like, you wouldn't take me out like this. And then I start looking around the plane. It's a bunch of wild spring breakers. I'm like, what if we're collateral damage, you know? <laughs> Like God's wrath is going to come down on them, and, and Monica and I just got on the wrong plane, you know? And, and that's, that's one story. But here's the problem. Here's why I was afraid of flying is because I wasn't in control. It wasn't really a fear of flying. It's that I wasn't flying the plane. And that's what's weird about that fear is in some strange ways, I would rather be flying the plane than the guy who's flying the plane, like the one that, that spent all the time learning how to fly the plane. I've never flown a plane, but I'm like, hey, can I have the will because I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night? You know, can I, can I try to do this? Can you give me a shot? And I don't know that guy. I don't know his training. I don't know, like when we hit that pocket, is he panicking up there? I can't see him. Is he afraid? Is he concerned? You know, I, I don't know what's going on in his mind. And the truth is that my fear of flying was simply not trusting the one who was in control. And so as we're remembering, singing all these praise songs, God, you're holy, you know, you did everything, you're amazing, you got plans for my life, but do I trust your control? For just a few minutes together, as we open the word, I want to talk about 
remembering the one who's in control. It's a really good thing to remember. Over and over, day in and day out, every moment, remembering the one who is in control. Because nearly every worry and every anxiety and every time that, that you face some fear, the reality of it is, is it's because you're not in control or you don't trust the one who is. Now you can almost trace every anxiety, every worry that you have to that reality right there. I don't trust the one who's in control or I'm angry that it's not me. And so I don't know what turbulence life has thrown at you as you walked in through those doors today. Some of you, you're here because it's kind of a last resort. You know that life's been crazy and you're like, linger, honey. I gotta linger, I gotta linger, I gotta get there. And you made it, I'm proud of you for prioritizing this. But I don't know if you know you're single and you're tired of being single, or, or maybe you've been struggling to get pregnant, or, or maybe you just lost a baby. Or maybe it's a job that you have that you can't stand. Or maybe you wish you had a job that you can't stand because you've been looking for one. Maybe the kids, one of them has left the faith or, or, or one of them are being bullied at school or, or school is hard. Or maybe it's that you're not feeling well. Maybe it's some illness in your life or maybe it's the illness of someone that you love deeply. Or maybe it's that you don't have enough money to pay the bills. I don't know what the bumps or, or the rough patches that God has you traveling through right now. But as we move through this very popular psalm, I know that we can remember that God is our provision, that we can remember that God is our protection, and that we can remember before you leave here today, before you do anything, as we move to worship, that you can remember that he's a prodigal father. And I, I'm going to explain that in just a moment, what I mean by that. But the passage that I'm going to be in, it's the most popular passage of the Old Testament. It's been in movies like Jarhead, Titanic, True Grit, featured in an episode of Lost. It's Psalm 23. And you'd be like, oh great, JP, didn't you get to choose what you're teaching? Like you're gonna go funeral psalm on me? Like you're gonna go most popular? Like you're gonna explain the one that we all know because we're super Christians that linger? And, um, <laughs> and yes, I am. Because it's a psalm that's ministered to me recently. It's been featured in Songs, U2, Kanye West got on the Psalm 23 bandwagon, and of course, Coolio, you know, Dangerous Minds, you guys know it. <laughs> I won't sing it. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I take a look at my life and realize, okay, maybe I will sing it, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is David's greatest hit. This is Shepherd. David, I, I mean, this is the one that uh, we would keep going back to. If you went to David's concert, this would be the, the song that you couldn't wait for him to sing. Uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's got some staying power, this song. Like, nobody's singing Taylor Swift 3,000 years from now, but we're here, and we're still gathering around this song. I love this song, and, and then I read a book by Philip Keller, which I, I commend to you, a, a shepherd's look at Psalm 23 is the name of the book, and it put it in context for me that David as a shepherd, what he was actually writing, what he was seeing, and it really taught me a lot about this because Philip Keller is a sheep herder or a shepherd for short, and so I've spent some time with sheep too, true story, okay, I grew up in a small town, was in 4-H, here's a, a picture, that's me, that's a real sheep, that's my real hair, and... Um, <laughs> And so I just want you to know that you're in good hands as we move through this shepherd's passage. Between Philip Keller and I, we know sheep. So let's go. All right, Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. David is saying, Yehovah is my shepherd. If he was talking about a company, he would say, God is my CEO. If he was a student, he'd say, God is my teacher. If he was a, a gym rat, he'd say, God is my trainer. If he was a, an athlete, he'd say, God is my coach. But no, he's a shepherd. And he says, the creator of the heavens and the earth is the one watching over me. What do I need? And what he makes clear up front is his role. And that's your and my role. We're sheep. And sheep's the single most vulnerable animal 
in the animal kingdom. They've got no talons, no claws, no fierce teeth. Right? Like you see fighting lion, like lions or, or NFL teams and cougars and, and bears and jaguars and, and fighting rainbows, but no fighting sheep. You, you, sheep, you, you, know, you know that what happens when a sheep is afraid? It falls over. It freezes in fear. You know one of the causes of death of a sheep is that it gets casted. That means it, it rolls over on its back and it can't get itself upright and it dies. This is a defense, I know, sad. It's a defenseless animal. This is you and me. You know what it means? For survival, we have to have a shepherd. We're lunch without him. Like, we have no hope without him. And so I don't know who God is to you when you came in here, if he's a strong tower or mighty fortress or big giant creator God, but David's saying, no, Yehovah, I know him. I'm with him. God is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. This is where this journey takes us. This psalm's gonna take us to three places. The Greenlands, the valley, and the tablelands. It starts in the Greenlands. There we are in the pasture. We're surrounded by grass and everything that we need. He makes us lay down. Philip Keller said there's four things that a sheep needs in, in order to lay down. There are four things that have to be true. One, it has to be free from fear. That if, there's even, if they even smell a predator, they will remain on their feet. Or if they smell a wild dog, they will scatter. It, for, it, for a sheep to lay down, it has to be free from fear. Are you afraid of job loss, relationships, kids? What, did you, what fear did you bring in? What's keeping you up at night? It has to be free from conflict. In fact, if there's one angry sheep in the herd, all the, the herd will stay on its four legs. It has to be free from conflict to lay down. What conflict are you thinking about as you're driving down the road, conversations that you're having in the car? It has to be free from parasites and flies. He says, he likens these to the little inconveniences in life that God has plans for that get spun up in our head, the buzzing around our minds. And the fourth thing, it has to be free from hunger. Because when you're focused on what you want, you can't rest. When you lay down there in your bed and your mind is spinning around the things that you want. In fact, a sheep will do anything to get to green pastures. The, sheeps, the sheep have literally strangled themselves in a fence trying to get to green grass. Just striving. What are we striving for today? Do you believe that God would give it to you if it was best? He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. The other biggest need of a sheep other than food is water. And sheep drink from the, the cesspools of their hoof prints where they defecate and they urinate the, and the, the water sits there in the mud and that's what they'll drink from. You know why? Because sheep are afraid of water. And I read this and I was like, is that true? Sheep are afraid of water? Why are sheep afraid of water? And then I kept reading and it, and it all made sense because they're basically like 30 sweaters with four drumsticks. Like that's what a sheep is. They're a sponge, they can't swim. If they get wet, they sink. So of course they're afraid of water, and especially raging water, like river water. And so he leads me beside quiet, fresh, refueling, refreshing water. And you and I, we often drink from the sources that kill us, rather than going to the everlasting well of Jesus. He guides me in paths of righteousness. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. For whose name's sake? For his name's sake. He delights in blessing us so that others would know him. He's a great shepherd. God, God's reputation is on the line in how he cares for the sheep. And so the first point I wanna give you from this text is that we're to remember God as our provider. Remember God is your provider. And that there's nothing that you should want to take that he's not giving you. There's nothing that you should be, uh, you know, climbing for or striving for that God's not behind pushing you, saying, yes, take it. 
And sometimes in life, like we, we in our flesh, in, in our sinful desires, we're seeking something that God doesn't have for us. And it says in the scripture that he's a loving father, that he seeks to give good things to his children. And so you're looking around and you're like, but what I have isn't good, to which I say, then God is not done. If what you have is not good, then God is not done. Because what father, if you ask him for a loaf of bread, is gonna give you a stone? And if you ask him for a fish, he's gonna give you a snake. And if that's how your broken, sinful, earthly father provides for you, how much more a shepherd who loves you and lays down his life for you to protect you will provide for you. You can trust him. He guides you in paths. He's directing your paths. You don't wanna go anywhere that he's not sending you. And there's this peace in the will of God, in the path of righteousness. I want you to say this in your heart. God, I'm not going anywhere, you're not taking me. Will you say that with me? I'll say it first. God, I'm not going anywhere, you're not taking me. That's right, let him lead you, guide you in paths. I want you to say in your heart, I'm not in control. You're in control. I'm not in control, you're in control. I um, shared this a couple years ago, and it's just a parable, a, a real life parable that's ministered to me as a dad. When I would go to the grocery stores when my girls were younger, uh, we would get that shopping cart with the, the car on the front. Do you guys know the one? the shopping cart with a car on the front. And so when it's not flu season, you know, and I can wipe that thing down, I would put them in that shopping cart and, and we would play uh, this game. And the game was simply like, where I was the motor and I'd watch them where they turn and I would take them because the, the steering wheel is pointless, it doesn't do anything. But I'd watch them and if they would turn right, I'd take them right. And if they would turn left, I'd take them left. And it was so fun just to, to let them go wherever they want and I was committed to going wherever they want. So we were bumping into the apples and they're falling down and bumping into the Kellogg's, you know. But I'm going wherever they wanna go. And they, they for all they know, it's a go-kart like they think they're in control but at some point in this game here's what happens they steer right and I take them left and I'd watch my girls just like me grip the wheel white knuckle and, and kind of frustrated and turn as hard as they can right and I'd effortlessly push them left and they're like, what happened? The go-kart broke, you know, what's going on? What? You know? And it's like, hey, sometimes in life we steer right and God takes us right. But sometimes in life we steer right and God says, no, I gotta go left. Why, why did I have to go left? Because I had an agenda called a grocery list. Do you know what my agenda was? See, they're all frustrated. Let me go where I want to go. Why won't you let me go where I want to go? Because I want to provide for you. You want to eat? I got to get some groceries. See, I'm here for a bigger agenda than you can see in your little car. And all you see is your own frustration that I'm not directing you the way that you want to go. But I want to give you something good. I want to provide for you something good in ways that you can't see. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. You see what just happened? The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. But now, in the valley of the shadow of death, you, God, you, it's you and me, we're talking like this. You are with me, your rod, your staff, they protect me. Because in the valley, that's when we're closest to the shepherd. Two for the sheep, too. You can see here in the valley, it is when they are closest to the shepherd. They're walking on paths. And the valley is a really scary place because they also are closest to the raging waters, also closest to the, the, the predators that seek to devour them. The cougars and the wolves, and they live in these cliffs. And they're walking right by, dependent on the shepherd, close to the shepherd because those things will devour them. They seek to steal, kill, and destroy them. And so it's them and the shepherd. Your rod and your staff, 
They comfort me. I've learned that Shepard used two tools, a rod, which is basically like a club, a bat, if you will. It's used for killing predators. And a staff, which is a long pole with a hook, like little Bo Peep, used for correcting them, putting that staff on a sheep's shoulder to direct their path, say, no, go this way, no, go this way. So God protects us and corrects us. He uses that staff to rescue them if they fall. He leaves the 99 and he goes after you. Do you think you're gonna outrun him? No, he's God. Do you think you're gonna move outside of, of, of some place where he can't find you? No, he's God. He's gonna, he's gonna leave the 99 and find you. He said that he will. And so God, our guide, he has everything he needs to protect us from evil. But JP, what if something terrible happens to me? What if something terrible happens? I mean, you're talking about worrying on a plane. Like, what a joke. What's wrong with you? Who's scared of flying? About eight of you, that's who, and me. But what about the real struggles of life? I found myself in a valley this summer. Man, everything was going right. Ministry was awesome. Teaching at places, traveling, getting to speak. And what happened in my own heart and in my own life is, is, is dependence. The thing that, that allowed me the privilege to talk about Jesus and to teach from this amazing, incredible resource I had moved away from to my own selfish dependence. I, oh man, I'm pretty good. You know, I'll get dressed up and get on that stage and get a microphone and I'm going from place to place. And, and, and I was teaching at a church in Austin and, and then some job offers came in. Hey, you want to take over this church? And I had just written a book and it was getting published. And I'm like, man, this is awesome. And then I'm on the way back home from Austin and this church on the West Coast called one of the largest churches in the world. Hey, can you fill in for our senior pastor? I'm like, man. This is amazing. And I go over there to California, and I'm staying in a hotel room, and I'm laying in that bed, and my heart starts beating funny. And I felt it. I'm like, man, something ain't right. Something's not right. And, then, and I'm not talking about worry. I'm talking about waves of anxiety came crashing over my body. Not afraid of speaking, nothing, not targeted at anything. I had no explanation. And I got through the message, and I got on a plane, I came home, and I went to the ER, and I'm lying in a hospital bed. If he makes you lie down, not he lets you lie down, not he allows you to lie down. He will make you lie down. And I sat there and they hooked me up to EKG machines and they're looking at my heart and they're like, man, you got some PVCs, premature ventricular contractions. I'm like, fix it. And they're like, we can't. I'm like, what do you mean you can't? And they're like, but you can. How? Slow down. How do I do that? Slow down. Slow down. And you know the most terrifying thing about the valley? So I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, have you forsaken me? Where are you? I'm praying. Are you listening? What's going on? Why would you do this to your servant, God? You want to take, what, what's going on? And he felt so far. That's the worst thing about the valley is the shepherd felt far, but he wasn't far. He was the closest he's ever been. Can look back and now I know he was the closest he'd ever been. He loved me and he was pursuing me and he was doing something that I couldn't see in the moment. I'm just frustrated. Why are you trying to slow me down? Because I love you. God is your protector. Number two, God is your protector. Stay close to the shepherd when danger is near. I know, I want you to know that I, I understand that we find rest in Jesus. I understand that he's our Sabbath. I, I, I delight in the reality that Jesus has done the work for me. But I want you to know that when Jesus was here in his ministry, that he gave us a lot of instruction. 
And there's a part that we play in pursuing him, getting to know him. And so many of us, it's like when the, the marriage goes off the tracks or something happens to the kid or we find ourselves without a job. That's when we're throwing up these Hail Mary prayers, you know, this like, okay, God, you got to hear me now. And he's a stranger to us. And that's why it's so important to make the lingering not just something that happens at a conference, but it's a daily remembering that what happens tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day, you are pursuing that God so that when trouble hits, you know he's right there beside you. And he's familiar to you. And you're just doing more in the trouble that you did yesterday. The same things, the same activity, because there's not cruise control in Christianity. It's not like we ever get to this plateau where it's like, okay, I've made it, and now I can stop pursuing God. I'm just going to stay in close relationship with him. Can I tell you something? There's not cruise control in any relationship. All relationships take pursuit and some work. I think too often we're trying to get to know him in the challenge. I was with my little girl at gymnastics not long ago. She was doing gymnastics, and it was around Halloween. And so the gymnastics place had a haunted house set up. Now, don't think scary haunted house. Think gymnastics haunted house. And, uh, and I'm sitting there, and she runs up to me. She's like, Daddy, I went in the haunted house. And I was like, was it scary? And she goes, I don't know. And I said, why not? She goes, because I ran out. And I was like, well, why? I was like, well, just go here. I'll wait here. Go through. She goes, no, I can't. I'm like, why? She goes, I don't know what's in there. I was like, just go find out. She's like, no, I'm too scared. And so we stood there. I walked with her, and we stood there. And I was like, you go. I'll wait right here for you. She's like, I can't, Daddy. I can't. Frozen in fear. I'm like, you want me to go with you? And she's like, sure. <laughs> now, nothing changed in the situation. Like, it's the same exact circumstance, only I'm with her. Like, one moment, terrified, I can't go, I don't want to do it, I'm alone. Oh, you'll go? Sure, let's go. Now, if we just could maintain that perspective, that God is with us in the valley. See, we want to get to the tablelands, but friends, and this is the hard truth sometimes, I got to tell you, as we're remembering who God is, that I want to get to the tablelands, but you got to go through the valley. It's the way to the table lands. It's through this broken world. There's cancer, disease, sickness, layoffs, infidelity, hurts, sin, hang-ups, brokenness, hardships. I know you want to get to the table land, but we got to go through the valley. I know we want the blessings, but sometimes we have to go through the suffering in order to get to the blessings. And so I know that when you're going through the turbulence, you're wondering, hey, is God's hand on the wheel? And I'm here to tell you that it is his, his hands are on the wheel. He knows what he's doing. If you want to experience the closest of God, you walk with him through the valley. Let me say it again. If you want to experience the closeness of God, you walk with him through the valley. See, that's the hard truth about this is so many of us, we want an emotional experience. We want to feel God. We want our hearts to be stirred toward him. You know, people come to me and they're like, hey, what do I need to do? To, to feel more of God and the Holy Spirit suffer for him because he draws near to those who suffer you remember Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego they're in the fire oh and there's Jesus and then there's Stephen they're throwing rocks at him till he's gonna die oh there's Jesus Paul says, I want to know him and be like him in the fellowship of his sufferings and be like him in his death. I want to know Jesus. I want to suffer like him. Friend, I hate. I hate that you're in a valley. Hang on. God's not done. He's taking you somewhere. Hang on. I came here today to tell you to, to hang on. I wouldn't choose the valley. I wouldn't have chosen the valley. But I know he's taking me somewhere to a blessing. And so endure the suffering. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Shepherds uh, of sheep call the higher land the mesa or, or the table. Here's a picture 
It's, it's the beautiful place, man. It's where the green grass is, and, and, and the shepherds go to incredible measures to prepare it. There's this, uh, this flower, this plant that grows there called the white camas, and the white camas is incredibly poisonous to sheep, and so before the sheep get to the table lands, the shepherd has to go in front of them and pick all of those flowers, all of those plants, all of those weeds so that the sheep can graze freely or they'll lose the herd. But once they have, once they've prepared it, there's no worries there because in the table land, the, the predators, they can watch, but there's valleys in between. They cannot attack a sheep if the shepherd's there. As long as the shepherd's there, a predator will not come close to it in the table lands because there's no way for that thing to get escape. There's no way for them to get free. And so this is the place where the sheep can, can be free, where they can breathe easy, where they can enjoy. He says, you prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. My enemies are watching as I enjoy and feast at the king's table. Our shepherd never sleeps. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Philip Keller said that a sheep's greatest annoyances are, are little bugs and flies that will buzz around their head. This shepherd goes to such great care to make sure that his sheep are comfortable. I don't want anything bothering you. I want you to rest here. It's a good shepherd. And God has gone to great lengths to, to rid your life of worries of this world, promising you another world, providing for you more than you need. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, not a temporary goodness, but an everlasting goodness following you like a shadow, looking behind you, oh, there's goodness and love. Yours might say goodness and mercy. There they are right behind me, following me everywhere I go, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The realization that our shepherd is good and he's taking us to a place where we will be with him in close proximity, in intimacy, with him forever and ever and ever and ever. This is, this is what we're moving towards. And we get to start living with that hope today. My, my girls were talking to my son when he was three and they were, they were teaching him about heaven. This is his first introduction to heaven when he's three. And they said, Weston, you wanna go to heaven? And he's like, no. And they're like, no, it's amazing. It's like Disney World. And he's like, you're trying to trick me. I'm not going there. And uh and they're like, no, you want to go there. There's lots of chocolate. You want to go to heaven. He's like, no, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. And he starts crying. And they start panicking. They're like, Weston apostatized. I'm like, no, he didn't. And they didn't say that word. I'm kidding. And, uh, and I'm like, guys, calm down. He doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know what it is. Weston. Weston, if you knew what heaven was, you'd, of course, want to go there. Heaven, Weston, if you knew what heaven was, you'd do anything you could to get there. You'd sell everything you have to get there if you knew what it was. And I heard this little voice inside of me say, do you know what it is? Do you know what it is? Remember, God is a prodigal father, the third point. Remember, God is a prodigal father. This requires some explaining because when you hear prodigal, you think prodigal son. What does it mean? Reckless? What does it mean? Runaway? What does prodigal mean? Here's how prodigal, this, this is, you know, Tim Keller wrote a book on this, a different Keller. Uh, Tim Keller wrote a book, Prodigal God, uh, on this idea. And so the, the, the prodigal son is called the prodigal son because he spent lavishly. And he was making the point, Keller was, that God is a prodigal. God spends lavishly on us. Here's the definition. Having or giving something on a lavish scale, spending lavishly. God is a prodigal father. He, he gives us a lavish dwelling place. His goodness and love, it follows us today. And you can think, man, God is big and he's sovereign and he's powerful, but if he doesn't love you, it doesn't matter. And he loves you. He's crazy about you. He, he goes to great lengths to try to show you that he loves you. And, and sometimes, and I love these moments, sometimes he just gives you those little reminders here. And I hope that happens for you here at Linger. I hope while we're worshiping, you just get a little bit of a reminder that he's good and that he loves you. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Those moments in life where everything is right. Maybe you're on vacation. Maybe the sun is setting perfectly over an ocean. Maybe you're walking through the forest and the sun is coming through and you can feel the warmth as it, as it breaks through the branches and, and the, the, 
you know, the leaves are, are breaking under your feet and everything is right. And you, you inhale and exhale and it's just all is right in the world. Those moments where you just experience true joy for a moment, that's a preview. That's God just saying, hey, this is what's to come forever and ever and ever. It's just a preview. It's just a taste. It's a sample. He wants you to know something. He says, hey, I love you. I love you. I'm crazy about you. How do you know? But how do I know you love me? My daughter, Finley. She wants a puppy. More than anybody has ever wanted anything in existence, this little girl wants a puppy. And there's a problem with that. Monica and I, we see pets different, dogs different. Like she views them as an extension of the family, you know, um, that they sleep in bed with you, that kind of thing. And I view them as dogs. And, um, <laughs> and so we had outside dogs growing up. And, um, and so we signed a, signed a prenuptial agreement that we would never have dogs because <laughs> we just don't see eye to eye. And, and there's no way. My little girl, you know, she wants a dog, but there's no way I'm going to be able to give her a dog. Like, it's just not going to happen. You're not getting a dog every day. Daddy, I really want a puppy. Daddy, this friend got a puppy. Her daddy really loves her, you know. And... Uh, and um, <laughs> You're not going to get a puppy. You're not going to get a puppy. But I love my daughter, and I delight when she delights. And so I did somehow this crazy thing. I mean, by supernatural strength, got her a puppy for Christmas. I know. I know. Pray for me. And, uh, and we did the box and the bow and everything in and, and that moment. And, uh, and then the next day, it was like, what did I do? I got you a puppy, you know. And whoa. And um and, and, and now, you know, you got to take care of a puppy, and they're a lot of work. And, and, uh, and so I told her one day, I said, hey, the, the other day, actually, I said, you ever want to know? If you ever wonder, like if you're ever just going through life and you're like, man, does my daddy love me? You look at that dog. <laughs> you look at that puppy. And you know that I love you. I made a sacrifice for you. I set my desires aside for you. And God says, you ever want to know? I love you. You look at the cross. Did you look at the cross? You, you see? Man, I'm crazy about you. I'll climb mountains for you, run through walls for you, bust in doors for you. I'll go Liam Neeson on Taken for you. Like, I will leave. I'm, I'm going to get you. I'm crazy about you. Okay? I love you so much. What? I, I, I would kill for you. I would die for you. I did. Do you want to know if I love you? Look at the cross. David. David wrote this. You know, he's a shepherd, anointed. Anointed as king in 1 Samuel 16. Like, can you imagine a shepherd who didn't have voting rights in the pasture, equivalent today of, of like someone who had no place to live, smelt like sheep. In the Cinderella story, Samuel comes, hey, there, we got to find a king. Is it this one? 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 No, there's nobody left. Oh, there's the one in the field. It's him. He's anointed king. But you know what he does then? He goes back to tending to the sheep. And, and then he, he goes and he plays the harp in Saul's court. And he's got to be walking around the palace like, this is my palace, but I'll just serve the king. And, and then he Saul's armor bearer. Like he's in this, he's risking his life carrying armor for the king. It's really going to be his armor. Like this is the role that he's playing, but he's just trusting in an act of humility because God is my provider. No, he's my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of Goliath, I'm not going to be afraid because you're with me and you protect me and you correct me. 
and you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows, and surely goodness and surely love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in your house forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And so when I'm in a cave with this guy who hates me and wants to kill me, I don't need to kill him. And when there's a guy in the land who's twice my side, blaspheming and an entire army who's afraid, give me a rock. For your name's sake. For your name's sake. And so remember, John 10, Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, I'm the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. David knew the shepherd knew the shepherd I want you to remember that Jesus is your provision I want you to remember that Jesus is your protection and I want you to remember that Jesus is proof of a prodigal father I um, got over my fear of flying healed from it not afraid to fly get on a plane worry free the way that it happened, people always say, man, how did that happen? I, I rode next to a pilot one day on a plane. Uh, he was sitting back there, and I just was asking him a lot of questions. I'm like, man, like, is this thing safe? He's like, yeah, man, it's safe. What do you mean is it safe? He's like, I just don't like to fly, you know. And, and he goes, oh, yeah, it's safe. I'm like, D you know, aren't you ever afraid the wing's going to fall off? True, I really asked, and he said, how many times have you read the news, and you're like, oh, there's a plane, and the wing just fell off, and he's like, these, these wings can go straight up, and he started telling me about the plane, but, but then he started telling me about the pilot. He said, you know these guys, they, they used to fly fighter jets at mock speeds. You, you know, I said, I said, well, when you hit bumps, are you worried? He said, worried? He said, we're having fun. I said, come on, you're not having fun. He said, that's the only part of our job that's remotely interesting. Like, like these things fly themselves from one place to another. Sometimes we get to hit some bumps and actually like grab the wheel and move to another place. Like the rest of it, it's on autopilot. He's like, we're having a blast up there. I'm like, you're really having fun? He's like, we're having a blast. He said, besides, you know how many times those guys have flown? Like next time you get on a plane, you look at the pilot, especially a commercial uh, uh, airline. You look at the pilot. Look at his gray hair. Look at the stripes on his sleeves. That represents tens of thousands of hours, maybe hundreds of thousands of hours, flying that piece of metal from one place to another. You're a bump on his agenda. Like his resume is flawless. The fact that you see him means he's never wrecked. Like, he's, he's got you, you know? And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, these things, they, they pretty much fly themselves. Like, you've got nothing to worry about. He said, hey, just look at their resume. I want you to remember that God, God's created everything you see. He breathed it into existence. You remember when his people were caught up in slavery? He rescued them. What he did was he parted the sea and he made a way for them and then he delivered their enemies to them and he unlocks wounds and he provides water from a rock and he provides manna from heaven and he brought down the walls of Jericho. He froze the sun allowing victory. He's toppled giants with tiny stones. He's brought fire from heaven. He shut the mouths of lions. He preserved life in the belly of a well. He's fed thousands with a few loaves. He gives the weak strength. He heals the sick. He's made the blind see 
see, the deaf ear, the mute speak, the lame walk, and he's overcome evil, and he's made a way through death for you and me by the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, that we will live with him forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we afraid of? His resume is flawless. He controls everything. And he loves you. He's crazy about you. He's got a plan for you. He's a good shepherd. Let me pray to him. And then we're going to worship him. And Father, you have saved a wretch like me. given us life after life. Father, I have a son, Weston, you know him. I don't want to lose him. And I can't think of a person I would lose him for. Not one. God, that you would give your son for me, that you would give your son for these people. That while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Father, you're our shepherd. What do we want? You make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside still waters. God, restore our soul. Lord, would you guide us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake? And when we are in the valley of the shadow of death, would you remind us that you're protecting us, watching over us, that you prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies, that you care about our comfort, and you love us that much. We have more than we could ever need. Our cup overflows. And you surround us with goodness, we just need to look around us even now and love. And we get to dwell in your house forever, at your table forever, at the wedding feast forever. We get to be with you forever, with Jesus forever. God, why? Why?